Hello and welcome to Warhammer 40k Book Club. This is episode 10, in which we're discussing Celestine the Living Saint by Andy Clark. I'm Jen Bozier. And I'm Carrie Honey. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. Every episode, we discuss a book that we've selected from the Black Library's Warhammer 40,000 catalog. We post the book on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, along with questions to ponder during reading. Listeners are able to read the book and then tune in to hear our discussion. We encourage participation through Twitter, the site, or Encrypted Box channel. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read the book, go ahead and visit the site, check out the book in the questions, and then come back to this post as we'll be discussing the book from start to finish in great detail. As mentioned, we're reading this week, we're discussing Celestine, the Living Saint by Andy Clark. The book is about the trials that the saint goes through. I actually bought one digital. It's like the first digital copy I bought in years, so. So she doesn't have my pretty cover. iPad. Um... So the book is about the trials that St. Celestine needs to go through as she, every time she's killed in battle and then comes back. It also gave us some interesting details in the saint's life and who she is as a character that I wasn't expecting. We posted several questions in the site, so let's dive right in. First off, did you like the book? I did like the book. Uh, it, it didn't have like the wow to me that Shroud of Night and Apocalypse had, but I still really, really enjoyed it. Same. I really enjoyed it. Apocalypse was a really tough act to follow. Yeah. Um, I think had I read it right after we read Shroud of Night, I probably, it probably would have had a little more oomph to it. Um, it's, it's an interesting book for reasons we're going to dive into later with some of our questions. But yeah, I liked it. Yeah. Um, what parts really stood out to you? Aside from the thousand sacks of awful, or awful, however, however you pronounce it. It's awful, isn't it? it? Might be awful. Either way, it's still awful. It's disgusting. It's awful, awful. Okay, it's just that the whole maggot scene. Like at one point, I was reading it and was like literally going like this because it's just. <sighs> and I keep in mind, I actually really generally like the Nurgle guys. Like the stuff in Dark Imperium didn't bother me, but this just. I think it was the part where she was immediately driven back as rancid fat and slime jetted out from the wound. Ah! <laughs> Hard pass. Hard pass. That was really gross. And it didn't help that I read the character, the maggot's voice. I read it or I heard it like um, the turtle from the never ending story, which I don't know why, like, I guess because when I was a kid, that voice always really bothered me. Oh, so, it's disgusting. It was a mucus filled voice. It was that we are not. So, oh, uh, the whole scene was so gnarly. Uh, so, that part really stood out. Um, not least of all, because it had a Batman reference in it. <laughs> Yet here I am, the immovable obstacle that puts to lie your irresistible force unstoppable force immovable object <laughs> i loved it though i got to that and i was like oh you <laughs> <laughs> well say also on one hand i it's always been a really cool quote right but also i like the idea of celestine is just being this unstoppable force right because she is darn it pretty much yeah as long as yeah. she keeps doing these trials i suppose which I think that whole concept really stood out to me. The fact that every time she dies, she has to go through these trials, these same things. She wakes up on a mountain of bones. She has to go and find faith. She has to go and find duty, who first manifests his purpose and is a real asshole. And then she gets, would you say tempted? Tested by hope? I think, I think most of those... I think you could argue a lot of those were a, a, a temptation test. Right. You know, I kind of found a lot of this, uh, likened a lot of it, actually, especially with what they would use to get her to stay uh, to uh, Jesus's temptation in the desert with, 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 the, with Satan. Uh, just, you know, saying these things, it's like, you know, um, you're hungry, right? Well, just make these stones turn to bread or you know in the case of the maggot he's just like you're tired aren't you aren't you just so tired she's like i am tired and it just or a lot of that goes temptation just to you know just let it go just go to sleep stop the fighting 
That's what a lot right. of the temptations were, and especially with hope, it was stop the fighting. Just, just stay with me. Can we just stay here on this beach? Which sounds lovely, right? Well, and I liked, I liked how every time when the things would be tempting her, eventually she'd be like, you know what? That is a good point. I think there's the one when she's climbing the crystal mountain and the reflection of her is like, these people don't even care about you. And she's like, you know what? I think you're right. And then as soon as she had the thought cognizantly, then she'd be like, no, nope, not the case, which I really like. Like same thing when she's sitting in a talk with Hope and she's like, oh, I guess you know, I could just stay here. No, no, I can't. And so that, I really loved that. I loved the Cadians. I loved, uh, Macklin, I was so upset when she dies. When she drove herself into the wall on one hand, I was like, oh my God, yes. But that really upset me. You didn't even really get to know her character that well. But well that, that was, uh, gosh, I can't even remember his name, but that was like his closest friend. You know, that was, you know, and he was having, you know, um, his own doubts of faith and everything, which yeah. I guess would totally be normal when you're out in the Imperium Nihilus. You don't have the Astronomicon anymore. You feel all alone out there. There is nothing. What's the point of faith? We're all alone. We don't no longer have right. the Emperor's light out here. Blast game, by the way. Okay. Oh, um, you know, just you know, having all that, he, she was the one person he could tell this to, and she, you know, might not agree with it, which she did not, and she had no problem, like, re, you know, reading him the riot act, but at the same time, he knew she wasn't going to go report him. She wasn't going to go, you know, turn him in or remove him from, from his office or go <laughs> run to that wonderful priest nobody liked, uh, Goffrey. So I'm going to go ahead and say, <laughs> if we didn't already say spoiler alert, uh, so when I was reading Goffrey, I have to admit that part of me was kind of like, oh, hmm good yeah he's gonna end up being the guy who's corrupted by chaos but he doesn't realize it and he's an unwitting tool of chaos and we're gonna go down that tropey road so as soon as he revealed that he was an inquisitor <laughs> i both hated him more but i also really liked it because i was like oh you bastard <laughs> and by that i'm totally referring to andy clark <laughs> I just, I did not even see that coming. And it was so brilliant. It got no, there. I, was like, I didn't oh, see it coming because you and I course. talked about it because you're, because we're both like, oh, priests supposed to be psychers. And you're all no. like, no, no. Like he's an unsanctioned psyker. He should have been on the black ships. And I was like, yeah, this just doesn't seem right. Oh, well, there's a reason for that. Where is, and that was a thing that I loved and I found so very interesting when he's i can't remember what page it's on what matter because i read the digital copy anyways it would be different from yours they um when he come when uh goffrey comes charging in with his thralls to attack the saint there's this moment where, where they're like yeah by the way had there been had none of this had all the psychers not been purged from this legion and not be allowed a psyker would have seen the warp moving around him, would have recognized him as a psyker and could have alerted somebody that this guy was causing major, major problems. But here we are. And I thought it was such a, it was such an odd, but very interesting point to make. And they make it, it's Sister Mer it's when it being told from Sister Meritorious's point of view. And it was an interesting little aside because they presented it as like an OBT dubs, which kind of made it this like um and i mean this in the best way possible but this passive aggressive commentary on the state of warhammer 40k like you guys are so scared of psychers you just got hosed by one the saint is gonna die because you guys had no idea something was going on so i really liked that because i've always i've always struggled with that as part of the warhammer i mean i i understand it but um it was, yeah, it was one of those little things. I was like, that's actually a really good point. I don't think with this, you know, the reading Eisenhorn, and it wasn't even the novels that did this. It was, it was the Keeler image short story. 
right that um where they the ordo hereticus had staged this elaborate trap to entice eisenhorn to be there to get his arch nemesis and they just and then they unfolded that they had set this whole thing up they were just killing everybody they didn't care they just wanted I care. their man they killed bunch of innocent people i guess they're not totally innocent because they're at this black market but still these people who had nothing to do with any of this they didn't care they just wanted their man and they would not at any cost and even eisenhorn would comment about that he was like oh when he just when he figured out it was hereticus was there he's just like figures they don't they don't care who gets in their way or what the truth is eisenhorn's one to talk given that he was going to use a chaos engine to massacre millions potentially okay this is before that though no i mean the order of hereticus they're in omelets and eggs type of person and you know if you need to crack a dozen eggs to make a three egg omelet yeah um and that's the thing that you and i've always talked about is just how grossly cheap human life is in the warhammer 40k universe and i think this really proved that too because Goffrey, how many Cadians? And just so we're clear, Cadia has been destroyed. These people, just like the Tanith, they're the last of their race. You know? They're an endangered species now. I think they even talk and, about that, how they're an endangered species. Yeah. It, you're just killing these guys, which, and we'll talk a lot more about Goffrey in a bit, but. But only that, I, killing these guys. Because you're looking for heretics. There's nothing. This is before the saint even showed up. Just these, you know, just looking for heretics. Looking for anyone who well, might not so actually, be in line with the emperor. So let's just dive into that question. So the question that I had was the throne damned motherfucking Inquisition. Is Goffrey's character a commentary on the Inquisition at large? The hereticus, I believe, absolutely. I go back and forth. <laughs> with the um, Xenos and the Malleus all the time. And I think it's it doesn't help that I keep reading these stories with the Grey Knights working with the Malleus. And so I see some of the good in this. Now I can also, or I, I can't, but it can be easily argued that the reason why those Inquisitors are fine is because they are with the Grey Knights and the Grey Knights will not let them overstep boundaries and, des right. and destroy things. Um, but I mean, I kind of see... And the, all the, the Xenos, like, I kind of go back and forth on that, you know, because that was the order that Ravener was a part of. But at the same time, like, really what, I don't understand what good that they're really doing, um, to be totally honest. I mean, yes, they're looking for... We suffer not the Xenos to live. Well, but it's not even just that. Like, uh, like in, in Ravener, the first book of Ravener, they're looking for these flets, which is these things that you can look into and it basically comes like a drug and it's from it's from xenos so that's why they're after it it has nothing to do with the fact that it's creating these you know guys that are drugged out of their minds and this whole society is going downhill it's because xenos brought it in it just seems right. very once very short-sighted in the long yes. run the order of xenos they just they really don't like xenos and Typically, you would think that they would spend the majority of their time dealing with the Tau. And of course, now, at the risk of using uh, Reddit speech, um, or not using Reddit speech, as it were, Gulliman's new BFF, uh, she's an Eldar. Um, I refuse to call them Eldari. Um, so you have like, you have the Ordo, the Ordo Xenos, I feel like it's kind of um, We've seen some of the Ordo Malleus being kind of but it's the order hereticus always seems to be the guys who've got just skeletons upon skeletons in their closet and goffrey goffrey was just it actually reminded me of going back to eisenhorn do you remember that short story in the magos with the people who are fighting the war and they're kill us, killing innocent citizens or like you know maybe somebody was like oh throw them damn it and they're like yeah that person's a heretic right they're oh, fighting this so, war such a sad short story it was a metaphor. Um, <laughs> yes, it was, but it was still very sad. Which I realized at three in the morning. That's why that's funny. Um, so, yeah, so you had, it reminded me very much of that. Goffrey did, because you have this guy who's just 
so blinded. He's he's standing in front of the emperor's divinity come to life. I mean, she's literally the living saint. She is proof of the emperor's divinity for him. And he wants to kill her because she's an agent of the enemy. So I'm starting to wonder, like, I mean, I felt that it was a com- it was kind of a commentary because you see this in Eisenhorn, you see this in other short stories where the hereticists are so, so determined to find witches. They see conspiracy and witchcraft in every corner. So now I'm thinking of the Toy Story meme, just her- heretics. Heretics everywhere. Heretics everywhere. Exactly. Exactly I, that. I, and I, I totally believe that that's how the Order Hereticus is. Like, they're just... Um, Gosh, there's like so many like movies about this, like, you know, the new person on the FBI or the CIA who seek a spy everywhere because they want to prove themselves. Right. And that's just kind of how, you know, the Ordo Hereticus is. They almost, they, they really cannot see the forest because they're looking at not trees, but at blemishes on trees or right. perceived blemishes on the trees. They're, they're so focused in what, not even that, but they're so focused in what they believe is right. That and nothing else matters. Wholly unquestioning in yes. that belief. Um, they're the um, often wrong, but never in doubt. Right? Like, Goffrey, Goffrey, the arrogance on display in his character was, it was staggering. Mm-hmm. Because... Not only does he know for a fact she's a tool of the, en- the enemy, he is just gobsmacked. He's eclectic that not everybody else sees this too. And as you said, like throughout in the very beginning, he's sitting there nudging people, trying to get them to fight him, right? To prove that they're also heretics, which, dude, the Cadians get out. Like, <laughs> I did like when he's goading the first guy and the guy just looks at him and he's like, Katia stands. Just awkward typo. Stood. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but like it just does those stand. It stands in here. <laughs> it stands. They're gonna put it back together with flex tape. It's cool. Um, it's just gonna be like a moon base. Um, GI Joe taught me that's a thing. And so, but I really I liked. I hated his character. But I also liked, I liked him as this just this commentary on the Inquisition in general, which after reading Spear of the Emperor with their whole, we'll wipe out an entire chapter of Space Marines just to prove the point. I feel as though there's this shift in the Warhammer 40k universe right now. It's been a while. Now, granted, we are going to read Carrion Throne and um, the the hollow vaults eventually hollow yeah 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 hollow mountain. Just, hollow mountain the vaults of terror that's where the vaults was coming in we are going to read those eventually which my husband's doing it right now and he says they're actually very good but there so that ex- excluded there does seem to be this very palpable shift towards portraying the inquisition in not a great light and maybe it's just because i keep like whenever i think of the inquisition the first thing that pops into my mind is always eisenhorn right and ravener and a few other ones who are definitely the heroes of their stories or they appear as just like hey i'm a helper uh sometimes very callous helpers but this is the second book and very recently that we've read where the inquisition is straight up doing untoward things it's not even like i guess i could see why you would do that no this is just straight up awful i'm thinking that maybe the inquisition um of course, the, those in the Imperium Nihilus wouldn't know this because Gulliman came after the eye opened. But um, they're losing their position because the Inquisition has always been like, you know, the only person, the only thing that overwrites us aside from other Inquisitors is Big E. So we are it. And so they've always kind of done things on their own. Now that Gulliman is back, though, and he's just like, I don't think so. And not only that, but they've basically made him Malkador. They've made him the voice of the Emperor. 
He's in charge. What he says goes. And he's having none of it. He is pissed that the Inquisition has buried texts that, that they feel people don't need. Because it's not controlling their message. And, you know, and Eisenhorn even did the same thing in the Keeler image when all those papers fell out of the painting. And he sees that where she's talking about how he's not a, that the emperor himself said he was not a deity. And he's like, oh, we have to get rid of that, you know, for, for the good of society. For whose society? For yours? So that you all can keep the people, you know, under check? Well, Goleman's just tossing all that right out the window. And I can almost guarantee you that Goleman had no idea in regard to this, you know, spirit, the Emperor's Spears visit that he had, someone had planted an assassin to go just wipe out oh. the Celestial Lions. No idea. Actually, because so along those lines, there's uh, Dan Abnett's Brothers in the Snake, which I think it's available on ebook. I think I heard that they're going to republish it or maybe they already did republish it. Fantastic book. I recommend everybody go read it. They're going to republish it. Cool. Okay, I thought I saw that. There is a fantastic scene in there in which they're trying to evacuate this planet and this one princess is not going along with the rules and one of the space marines, a space marine who's a big guy, you know, slightly big, is telling her, he's like, no, you can't be here. And she's like, fuck you, peasant, and shoots him, right? And he's like, uh, he doesn't know how to react. And then the Inquisitor shows up and shows her his rosette. And she runs screaming away. Space Marine is lowly peasant to be shot. Inquisition is real shit. The Inquisition, you know, is kind of like the KGB. Oh my god, they totally are. <laughs> they're like, actually, they're like the KGB was in like any 80s movie where they were like this super, super, like, Every superpower and like really sinister thing we attributed to them, straight up, straight up. And it's so that was an interesting counterpoint in this because you're dealing with literal chaos, mm -hmm. and then this asshole who thinks Which, he knows what literal chaos is. I guess he feels like he would know that that was the saint. He would just know, right? Or maybe because she didn't ask for his blessing first. I. No idea. Well, I don't know. So one of our other questions was the Black Library seems to be leaning heavily into questions of the of faith in the grim dark future. We read there's the Dark Imperium books in which uh, Gulliman's really wrestling with the concept of faith. We saw a little bit of it in Shroud of Night, right, with the saints showing up. Um, obviously this book, obviously Apocalypse. They seem to really be leaning into this concept of faith. Did this book convince you of the Emperor's divinity? Oh, you know, that's so hard. That's still something I am wrestling with. I don't, I mean, does he have to be like a god or can he just be just you know, super powerful? I mean, if you want to say that's what makes someone a god is that they are this all powerful being. Well, okay. And I don't know why I wrestle so much with, with, with the emperor being divine because, you know, my personal faith shouldn't have anything to, to do with it because I read, you know, all kinds of fantasy books that have different gods and all that. And I'm just fine with it. And I don't know if it's because from reading Horus Heresy, I was taking all of that to heart. Like, no, he's saying that he's not. But now I go back and forth on that because now I'm wondering because early on in the Horus Heresy books, they talk about how he is not divine and he's doing everything he can to free mankind from the shackles of religion. And I'm wondering if that's because in all of his lives or his very, very long life, all he's seen is that when they are worshiping something, everything devolves. So he doesn't want to be the focus of religion, which is to quote someone from the Horus Heresy, he's like, only a divine being would insist they're not divine. Well, okay, you know, I, I can kind of see that. That's really what his goal is, to bring everybody together to not be religious and to not be worship, to worship him. I totally understand that. Um, but I mean, it's really hard because the way, this, you know, I can argue like, oh, you know, I don't know what she is. After reading this, now I do know what she is. She is... She has a mission, whether it's from the emperor or from the true good div uh, divinities out there. Because like you said, I do believe there has to be the balance. And they always say the emperor is the balance to the pantheon. 
So that would such say that he was a god, but at the same time, is he really the god or is he the mouthpiece of the other gods? I don't know these answers. I'm sure the guys at Games Workshop are going, you're thinking way too hard on this. Um, but she definitely has that divine influence. Like, you just don't keep coming back. And not only that, but he's, but the emperor has chosen someone who even when she picks up her pieces of armor and she gets these flashbacks of how she died that particular, you know, in that particular instance, I mean, her armor is probably multiples everywhere. And every time she picks one up, every, every, um, death, she gets another flashback of s some other death, but to pick those up, see how you've died in these horrible ways and to keep going. That's in some amazing character. And I, I, right. I'm curious, like, you know, who she was in the beginning and why she got tapped. Maybe that'll be in the Siege of Terra, the Siege of Terra books, which would be kind of nice. Right. Because did you, did you pick up on the fact yes. that she was in the Siege of Terra? Yeah, she was there. So she's old. Yeah. Well, and like, and I knew because it, in other stories I've read and they mention it very briefly in Shroud of Night across countless lifetimes and blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, okay. I didn't take that to mean 10,000 years. Holy cow. Like that. So Celestine's faith in the emperor is obviously unshakable. Do you find it believable? That this character can die. Who knows how many times, 10,000 times. And she just keeps doing it. Cause when you get to the end of the book, she wakes up upon the mountain of bones. And her first thought is, all right, let's do this again. You know, um, <laughs> I do think it's believable and only because I think if, if God did choose Joan of Arc, really did choose her to be his saint and leading France to, uh, to reunite France. And if, you know, obviously she did her mission. Her time was up. She succeeded in a way, but if God brought her back, I bet she'd be the exact same. Her faith would be there 100%, even though she knows she was burned on the stake, that she was betrayed, all these things happened, she would do it all over again, 100%. Because she was someone whose faith was unshakable, no matter right. what happened to her. Right. And... I did find that interesting at first, because at first as you start going through her first trials, right, I was like, oh, okay, like, eventually wouldn't she be like, you know what, I'm done, I'm just done. And I think it's when she gets to the maggot, and the maggot's just like, this is useless, why are you even trying, you can't even help. And all of a sudden, Celestine's like, yeah, if that were true why would you guys be trying to tell me this? Like, why would you be stop it trying so hard to get me to stay here? Oh, okay, that's a good point. And then when she meets Hope and she does have this moment of, but she has this moment of, no, I can't stay here. I have to get back. I have to fight. I have to help. And what's actually very interesting about this book is that a lot of times with Celestine, you can argue that, look, had she not been there? Like, in Shroud of Night, had Celestine not been there, things just wouldn't have worked out very well because ain't nobody else going toe to toe with the Karn, right? <laughs> with the Karn, have... <laughs> with Shelly Um they weren't getting that beacon off without the saint there. She really kind of was the glue for that. The interesting thing about this book, though, was that Celestine she had some divine moments. She had some moments where she really helped people. And I guess, oh, God, now, now that I'm talking this aloud, I'm like, oh, it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. Because she doesn't slay the main boss. That's Sister Meritorious does. But had Celestine not been there, Sister Meritorious wouldn't have rekindled her faith, and maybe she wouldn't have succeeded. So. Well, yeah. okay, like, I can, you can go back to Joan of Arc. You know, she was not the forerunner running through the, the walls, climbing the walls and killing everybody. 
she was a symbol in many ways and she stirred up everybody's faith just by seeing her there with her banner right well in like last game when she first appears he's like uh. right but then at the end there remember when um when the giant uh blood letter shows up and it's raining blood and the Cadians are just having this awful time and the saint is saves Blaskane and it's just a blinding light and all of a sudden he's like well I've been an idiot <laughs> clearly right which and which I thought was another really interesting piece of this is that Sister Meritorious has lost her faith entirely she talks about it being ash in her heart um Blaskane's kind of you know jack ecclesiarchy um Macklin, I didn't get the impression, was like super, super devout. You have all these people who were just kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, the emperor guy. Cool. I thought Macklin, like she um, she was probably more devout than than others. And oh, yes. um, with her, it was definitely like him. I felt like he was just jaded. Yes. My very planet's much so. gone. Now I'm on this hell hole. It feels like I'm always fighting. Like there's never any breaks from this. And she is just right there as a rock. It's just like, but we're where, but we're where the emperor wants us to be, and he's right. all like, "Are we? Are we? And, are we really?" Right. And then the saint shows up, and he realizes, "Well, okay, yes, we are where we're supposed to be. Even though this place sucks, but this is where we're this is where we're supposed to be." It was almost a way of like. This is, I hate to say that because it's awful to say it's about Cadians, but like, this is like, you know, we have one more mission for you to do. Well, they're not, so everybody always makes fun of the death core of Krieg, right? Because they just want to die and throw themselves in there. But the Cadians, they held the gate at the Eye of Terror, right? Mm -hmm. This was not an easy job. The Cadians, I mean, Actually, the Cadians always reminded me of, if you ever uh, read the book Dune or saw the movie Dune, it's the second time on this podcast I've referenced Dune, by the way, but um, there's the people from Arrakis, the Fremen, they say, they're like, we have a saying that God created Arrakis as a test for the faithful, one does not go against the will of God. And so that always reminded me of the Cadians, mm. like the test for them, right? And this is your job. And so when they're on this chaos planet yeah blaskin is he's very jaded but at the end there he kind of realizes like look <laughs> nobody else is gonna do this <laughs> this is our job right like we've always been you know the mm -hmm. the wall against chaos and by gosh we're still going we're still going to do that yes and he but i thought it was interesting because you have all these characters We've actually read a lot of books where and actually the um, the most recent one that I read that was really good was The Wicked and the Damned. Um, a couple of the characters mentioned how they're like, mm, yeah, the Emperor. Mm, OK, whatever. I'm not really sure I buy into all of that crap. So and for, I felt like a lot of the older books I used to read, too, people would be like, oh, yeah, the Emperor, mm, bless the Emperor. But they were always just kind of like, mm, it's just kind of like a thing that you say. Right. Whereas I feel like now, again, in this brave new world. <laughs> They're really tackling this concept head on. And I think, so the funny thing is, is that for years, I was always like, yeah, of course the emperor is a god, duh. And I'd read the Horus Heresy and I would just be like, oh my God, obviously a god, this is stupid. Why would you ever deny it, right? And then it was when I read Dark Imperium and Gulliman was like, he's not a god, I know I've talked to him. That I was kind of like, you know what? You have a point, point rowboat. <laughs> <laughs> but now I think reading this book, my first reaction was, oh, of course he's a god. <laughs> Duh. So, my faith was saved as well by St. Celestine. The other thing I'm kind of seeing in these parallels here is that, you know, like I said earlier, that the emperor wanted to reunite. The Great Crusade was about reuniting all of mankind across the stars, you mm -hmm. know, to, after the long night. And we're all going to unite um, without religion. And I think right. is, that was really because the emperor saw what ruling by religion does. Nobody wants a theocracy. And here, but here we have one. Oh my God, and how? And it's showing how bad it is. Yeah. 
that it does that it does not work and so i kind of love the fact that we're at this point and i'm seeing the parallels you know what the emperor was trying to prevent here we are it, you know he didn't it was not prevented in the end and but now we have gollum in here who's just like this is stupid this is not what my father wanted and gollum's almost like if he's divine or not this is not what he wanted like we know i walked with the guy I fought some wars with him. Right. For we, sure. We used to be like this, you know, <laughs> before to, he became, yeah. you know, kind of incapacitated. But so I'm actually loving where this is all going with the possible over uh, overthrowing of the ecclesiarchy because they've all gotten too big. You know, from the Inquisition to and sex like Frater Matthew and Right. You know, just kind of showing a lot of these, these corruption with these mm -hmm. these priests and these inquisitors. I mean, it was the same. I, you know, I'm reading, uh, I was reading the Blood Angels uh, omnibus, and in that there was the same thing. But we have, you know, word bearers who are mocking the Blood Angels because they have this rogue inquisitor in with them from Her Hereticus, and they're like, do you even know what you got? <laughs> like, you guys are so blind to this guy because he's the Inquisition and he's he's worshiping Zinch. I mean, <laughs> right? Uh, but well, just and I, I feel like we keep saying this. I feel like we're building towards a horse flip because yeah, in the heresy, especially like when you started at the beginning of the Horus Heresy, everything's great. Like the first book, everything's great. We're all friends. There's all this stuff, and then there's this dramatic upheaval, and I feel as though. We're building towards that again, especially with Apocalypse, right? Where you've revealed that a renegade slash saved slash forgiven word bearer has basically been writing the religion. Powerful message there, right? You have all these Primaris Marines who, especially in Apocalypse, it felt like, I feel like each book we read, the regular Marine, the OG Space Marines are becoming more and more verbal about how much they're not down with this. Right? So you have that piece going on. You have this where you're showing that the Inquisition the Inquisition needs a little bit of a scrubbing. Huh. A little, a little chlorine tab. Um, and by chlorine tab, I mean all the chlorine tabs. Yeah. I, I, I mean genocide. Anyways. Uh, like we're going to spike all their tabs with Drano. Yeah. <laughs> like just cheer those space marines to go through and kill them all um i have i have a very you know strong sense of justice um you but you have all these moving pieces now that every, like i feel as though if i have faith in anything every book we read i'm like oh yeah this world is about to change and how we just need to wake the lion up and things will get really interesting you know it's really uh interesting uh you know uh several years ago it's not several, but like a, a couple of years ago, 2017, it seems like so long ago. I remember when the codex released for Katia Falling. Mm -hmm. And you were just like, why now? Why are they letting Abaddon do this now? And you were telling me like he's a failure and he's a joke and the Night Lord's always made fun of him and, and stuff. And even... You know, our friend Ross was like, yeah, they're really changing everything with, with this. And we didn't realize how much they were changing it until we learned, oh, Gulliman's back. That's huge. Right. And ever since then, it's just, it, all it was was just one planet. But I find funny that Abaddon is really the catalyst for all this change. Yeah. Whether he meant to be or not. He is. Oh, yeah. And there was actually, so the funny thing was, is that, and I can't find this anywhere. If anyone listening to this has a link to this or has this saved somewhere, please send it to me. You know, the fallen meme, the Hitler finds out about X when he's screaming and he's yelling. So there was a reaction to Katie falling with that. And he makes a comment where he's just like, oh, yeah, everybody's super happy about us falling in with Kadia and the guy who's nervous. And he's like, people are really angry. They're saying it's the death of 40K. And then Hitler's doing the screaming thing. But he was like, we haven't progressed the story in 20 years. Right. 
when I watched it, I was laughing, but I was also like, you idiots. But now the more and more I read with it, I was like, oh, this is like a really interesting time. And there is a lot of stuff going on. And I think actually, you know, the book that convinced me of that was Apocalypse with the uh, word bearer piece. That was the first thing where I was like, okay, shit's getting real. And well, in this, again, with each book we read, it's just another little thing that I feel like something really awesome is coming. It's like the opposite of in our comic book podcast when we're talking about how we think that there's a reboot coming with DC and we just want them to get it over with already, but it's never going to come and they have no plan. Rip off that band-aid. Just do it. Do it already. Um, this is the opposite. These guys clearly have a plan and I'm really excited to see where it's going. Um, but the other thing that was really interesting, we touched on this a little bit, is that the Cadians, they've lost their home. And when they talk about for me, it was with Blaskane when he gets to relive those final moments of Cadia. Mm -hmm. Knowing he can't save everyone and the guilt, the survivor's guilt that comes with that. It was the perfect mirror, I felt, to Celestine's journey. Because remember, they tell her, one of her uh. doubts tells her, you can't save everyone. And she's just like, doesn't matter, I'll save who I can. And Blaskane, for the first half of the book, He's very much, um, he, you know, he talks about his private shame and how everybody's judging him because of it. But then when he relives that moment, you're like, dude, what else were you going to do? You could have stayed there and waited for those like 20 or 30 people and then killed everyone who was on your ship. It, it was yeah. Uh, if you guys haven't read uh, Katia Stands, I do recommend it. It's a really, really good book. But that scene he was talking about is vividly described in that book and it is heart-wrenching but you understand yes it's well in the whole yeah the whole fall of Cadia, and so i thought it was very interesting because you have this godly character she's a saint she's the literal again the literal expression of the emperor's divinity come to life but then you have these regular people who are also fighting that same battle and that same sense of we got to do what we got to do. And like, there were so many little things with it I really liked about this book in general, which actually we were talking about the parts that stood out to you. I compared this book to Captain Marvel, the movie. Okay. Because if you notice... At the end there, there's very few male characters in the story, as is. They're very much background characters. You have Macklin, right, who's a woman. Uh, Celestine, Meritorious, Kazradelt, who, in the end, when she shows up and shoots the Inquisitor, I was just like, yes, queen! <laughs> so excited! Um, it was an interesting choice. I'm sure, it was, I'm sure it was done conscientiously, but, and I liked that you have all these male characters who one of them's kind of the bad guy but I mean again you understand what he's doing he actually did kind of remind me of uh, Jude Law's character in Captain Marvel and Luskane kind of reminded me of Nick Fury actually he's just there to support and be really excited for everybody um, and I liked it because again you have these Cadians regular people mirroring that of the saint which I think made her feel a little more human Mm -hmm. which I liked hmm. glowing gold aura like Captain Marvel so that she really had wings yes she did which that was another part that I hated when uh, Purpose cut them off it made me wonder how real they are like are they part of your body or is it part of your armor so in the spirit realm, it appeared to be part of her body because remember she kept talking about how bad it hurt the wounds on her back. Mm -hmm. But they always describe it as being a jump pack. Right. And they talk about how there's silver metal wings, almost like Archangel from X-Men. So I get the impression that in the spirit realm, 100% real. But the ex expression of them in the real world is, or like that's the expression of them in the spirit realm. In the real world, it's a jump pack. Okay. Right. Um, which I'm going to call it audible and add a question that I forgot that I wanted to talk about. But one of the big questions that I really wrestled with going into this book was, do you like St. Celestine as a character? Oh, that's that's. Hmm. 
It's mm-hmm. a hard one, right? Because it is because it's not like she has like this amazing personality. She doesn't. No, she's just she's a savior. She's she's larger than life. Yeah. You know, and you know, even when she realizes what Goffrey's about to do, and she looks down at him with pity and like pleads with him all sadly. Like, I totally understand what she's doing. She's trying to appeal to this human side of him that does not exist. But at the same time, that's still not a personality. That's, I don't think she has one anymore. I think maybe Celestine did when she was, maybe. when she was a human. But I, I would think she's become so much of an extension of the emperor that she doesn't have that personality anymore. She actually reminded me a lot of when the Emperor appears in Horus Heresy books. Even in the um, ADB book, Master of Mankind, he's this larger than life. I mean, he's literally the Emperor. Personality or person, symbol, figure. His personality always seems to be more about the reactions that people have around him. And, like, Celestine is the same way. She appears, and it's all about the reactions to the people around her. Like, Meritorious looking up at her and being like, oh my gosh, right? Mm -hmm. And Blaskane. And even Goffrey, who looks up at her and is like, well, this is clear heresy. Um, She, it's hard because she's this really strong character. She's a strong figure, right? Smiting chaos and everything. But yeah, she doesn't seem to have a person it's the closest glimpse to personality I think we get is when she visits with hope. Yeah. And even that's a little questionable really, in terms of it. Because that was more of her being like, um that was more of her kind of acknowledging some of her own personal selfish I just want to chill. <laughs> I also think you see her personality when she wakes up on the Bone Mountain. Yes. Because she has no idea who she is. So she doesn't know what her purpose is supposed to be or her duty or what her faith is. Right. She has no idea who she is. She has no idea what she's doing there. She just knows that she needs to not be there. <laughs> right. Which, yeah, probably the closest thing to her personality. So the interesting thing is, I like her as a figure. I like her as a concept. I love, I like the book. I liked everybody's reactions to her. I loved, uh, there's a scene where Saint Mar- where Sister Meritorious talks about how she realizes that the saint looked into her heart, saw the ash, and did not judge her. Mm-hmm. Right? And that rekindles her flame. I'm not necessarily sure. Like, if I was trying to talk about the best female characters in the Warhammer 40k catalog, I'm not sure I'd put the Celestine. I'm not sure I would either. Even though she is a badass. Uh, um, yeah. Like you said, who else would go up against Karn? Where you got the Alpha Legion going, oh, fuck no. <laughs> we gotta go. <laughs> we you need off this planet. You have a who's like, no. Yeah, like, we need off this planet. And where she's just like, nope, I have to do this. Same with the Keeper. They see the Keeper and are like, oh my god. Thalassine's just like, and another one. Right? And- well, there's that description when Goffrey talks about her standing on top of the tank, looking up at the blood letter, and the blood that's raining from the sky isn't touching her, which it was so cinematic. You could just... Oh, yeah. Thing. And I said this also with Shroud of Night. Andy Clark has a very cinematic sense of language. So sometimes I have trouble picturing things in books, right? Or like you'll read something and you're like, oh, okay, I guess. I never have that feeling with his books. See, I'm always like, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I've got a name. I know what it looks like. I know what it sounds like. Awful. Awful, awful. That was... That part, that part, oh, God, no, it was the... When she describes how she could feel things crawling in, I was just like, oh, God, I can see this. And when she describes the smell, I was like, oh, God, man. His descriptive words are great. Um, I like him. Uh, There's just such a nice sense to this. But again, I'm not sure that I would... Yeah, I wouldn't be like, oh my god, you want a really good character? Now, I would recommend this book for Sister Veritorious. 
and Macklin and Kazrigel. Like, oh, you want to book yeah. the strong female characters? Go read Celestine. But it wouldn't be for Celestine herself, which is kind of weird. I don't think it's that weird. Because I, I don't think that some of these saintly... I mean, saintly figures, if you look at it, I mean, even like the those that we have dubbed saints of this day, yes, they were incredible people. Uh, they've done incredible things. I don't know if they'd have a great personality because that's not... Their personality doesn't matter anymore. It's their life's work. It's what they're going towards is what matters to them. Right. Which that, is interesting because Goleman is clearly a character. Right? Because like, I was trying to compare her to like the Primarchs. Right? Where I was like, oh, the Primarchs all have very distinctive personalities. When you care about them as characters and she's... She really does feel like just an extension of the Emperor. I need her to appear, appear on the inside of the Imperium. Maybe where Gulliman is, because I'm curious how that's going to work out. Well, because she's one of the, she's the saint who helped revive him. Oh my god, that's right. But he doesn't know she was there, I don't think. He doesn't talk about her I, ever. I think he just knows, because remember he talks about how, oh yeah, a saint was involved in getting me, but I couldn't tell, and maybe this is explained in a book or a codex or something, I couldn't tell if the effort killed her or not because the way that he says it when he was like yeah it took the effort of a saint the way he described it made it sound like she burnt out doing it like a light bulb i'm not sure though you know but i, don't I know. would love to see her and gulliman in a room well yeah especially after gulliman reacted to that little girl well actually you know what he never got a chance to react to the little girl he never got a chance to really talk to her or find out what she was and he the only thing he said was he's like i want to put her i want to put her away for right now i'll talk to her in a bit when i when i have some time because i'm not so trustworthy on saints because in my experience there are actual saints and but there are many more who are not right and well so, he dresses down freighter matthew later because he's like we still don't know what she was but right actually having read this i think maybe i'm changing my tune on that and maybe i can't say this too loud because my husband's gonna burst in and be like i told you so um we had this debate regularly uh i think she probably was a saint honestly kind of more like along the lines of saint sabbath than saint celestine well, I guess, I guess we need to ask in the Warhammer 40k universe, what makes a saint? And the interesting thing is that, like, St. Sabbath, her, one of her best, most badass moments is she takes out a Bane Blade tank with a sword. That's not a joke. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> um, but she doesn't have, I mean, she does have that saintly presence. Like, they talk about her having... They should describe her more as being like the star from uh, Starlight, Stardust, uh, when she kind of starts to shine a little bit. They talk about that and how they everybody thinks that she's always looking at them, right? Like whenever she's in a room, everybody's like, dude, she's not looking at you. She's looking at me. Um, but, but she doesn't have the same awe and presence. Now, maybe that she's just not high enough level, like St. Celestine has reached like, you know, the level cap. So she's just, you know. It's really awesome. But so the one question that I was going to call an audible on uh, before we wrap up is that who did you think, what was your impression of Hope? Let's put it that way. Because remember, she kept talking about how the little girl seemed familiar. Mm -hmm. And um, I read it as it being maybe her childhood innocence. Like maybe that was her as a child. And that's how she views her Hope being this childlike thing, right? That Hope is this delicate small young thing that she locks away in her heart at the end when she says that when she's like no hope is for me to me the whole idea of hope and hope wanting her to stay with her on that beach it was like hope that one day celestine won't need to fight anymore oh yeah no for sure 100%. and she can stay on that's uh, that's that's as far as i mm. as, as i as i went with it Fair. It was just one of those things because she kept talking about how it reminded her. And my husband was thinking that it was like, you know, like, oh, maybe this is a child that she had saved or her child or something, blah, 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 from a previous life. And it was like, no, I kind of imagined it being like her visioning herself as a child and being like, that's hope. It's this childlike innocence of her that, yes, someday 
this war is going to be over and she's just going to get to sit on a beach and the emperor is going to be like, you've earned your rest. Which, that'll be sad. Well, it can't happen because if it happens, then there's no more Warhammer 40k universe. Don't do that to the Games Workshop. Oh, I don't think they will. <laughs> uh, no, because, you know. That money, like, yo. They like money. Most people do. I like money. You like money? We I should hang like out. Money. I know, right? <laughs> so, the most exciting thing to wrap up this podcast this week is that our next podcast will not be on a split screen. We will be in the same room together. What? What? With a couple bottles of wine? Yeah, it'll be like our first annual Warhammer and Wine weekend. And it works because it's W and W. I know. I love this. So, yes, I mean, when you go to wine country, what else do you do except talk Warhammer 40k? I don't know what I would talk about with other people while drinking wine, to be honest. This is also why I don't have other friends. <laughs> this, is, this is how you get into drunken arguments about, you know, whether or not the lion's a traitor or not. With total strangers. I'm just kidding. I don't think anybody will have any idea what we're talking about. I was going to say, like, like, how long does that one-sided conversation go? <laughs> um, it's got so much alcohol I get in me. I don't know. <laughs> Could go a while. Like, so let me explain to you this entire situation and all of this backstory. And then you tell me what you think from my, like, again, it's the Pepe Silva, uh, always sunny <laughs> explanation. <laughs> Lines everywhere. Lines everywhere. <laughs> Want to take us out, Carrie? Yes, I think I will. I got, gosh, I got to rearrange everything on my desk. Good thing I haven't knocked over my drink yet, though, so <laughs> that's not too bad. I'm the worst. All right. Well, you have listened to the Warhammer 40k book club episode number 10 regarding Celestine, the Living Saint, and its glorious cover. But be sure to be with us for our next book which is going to be, we've been told a thousand times to get this, Watchers of the Throne, The Emperor's Legion by Chris Raitt. Apparently, yes. this is when all this hubbub begins with everything. I've been told this is really where it all sets in. And a lot of stuff that we've been seeing referenced like in Shroud of Night and Apocalypse and now this, this is where it begins. So... Did I imagine that, or did somebody tell us on Twitter that something that was referenced in Spear of the Emperor is explained in this, too? That was someone on YouTube. Thank you. Yes. We love you, random citizen. Well, I mean, this random citizen has, like, pretty much commented on every single video, hey, you need to read Watchers of the Throne. <laughs> like, well, we'll get there. Oh, okay, no, now, now we will get there. So, yes. So we will be there for next time. Um, just a reminder, we are an un unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those wonderful things to the vidcast on YouTube or on the podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher. Our site also has articles about our adventures and reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crag. Good night, everybody. Good night.